Hello, Dan. Thank you for coming. Yeah, thank you for having me. Really happy to be here. Um, maybe before we start, you can give a little introduction of who you are, what you do, and maybe how did you get into that? So um, I'm Dan or Daniel Mangena. Uh, I'm a speaker. I'm an author. I podcast. I write for magazines like Entrepreneur Mag, Brains Magazine, and a few others. And what I'm really all about, if we were to bring it to a real nutshell, is I believe everybody has something to contribute. And that the more we are aligned with abundance, we can contribute that. If I'm in lack, if I'm in fear, if I'm in anxiety, if I'm scared or stressed about stuff, I'm not going to be able to contribute. So what I'm really doing is actively supporting people in having the abundance allow them to make their contribution. Um, I do that through my work and I really came to that journey. Uh, I was dragged along by my ears. <laughs> I had no intention of doing this. I actually really did enjoy the life that I had. Um, I lived in London, born and raised in London, um, fly everywhere, first class. I had lots of watches. I had a tailor, you know, nice house. But this call for me to do something more with my life got stronger and stronger and stronger until I couldn't keep ignoring it and now my life's even better than it was before yeah so how what was the shifting point like what what happened that made you realize that maybe you want to take a different route mm -hmm. it wasn't that i maybe i want to take a different route it's that the different route kept hitting me over the head <laughs> <laughs> it's like so um it started this section of the dan story started uh i say 2000 and 2016. Mm -hmm. So I'd been working on what is now my book, Stepping Beyond Intention. Uh, we just released a new edition of it, but I've been working on that for about 10 years, something like that. Every time I thought I got it right, it wasn't quite right. And so I just sort of stopped. But then I started to do some work 2015, 2016 with a guy who's now famous before nobody really cared what I had to say about him, Dr. Joe Dispenza. Oh, yeah. Um, I started doing his work and it's actually when I went to my first event of his that I realized the model that I'd been sort of working on in my head was real. Because mm. it's different when you've got these ideas in your head than when a world-class thought leader and scientist, you're sitting in a room and he's like, well, this is why that works and this is why that works. I'm like, oh my God, this is like the science to back up what I've been, I'm not going crazy. Yeah. And I started to develop a bit more confidence Right, because um, I had the confidence of the first person experience because it was working for me, right? But when you're saying, oh, so this isn't just fluke, there's science to back up what I'm talking about. And so I doubled down my efforts to finish this book because I'm like, okay, this book might actually be real. And I, you know, imposter syndrome had been kicking in and all of that stuff, but now I had something to back mm -hmm. it up. So. I reached out and I asked a few people, hey, can you look at this draft of my book? Uh, some people in the meditation community that I was in and more and more people were like, oh my God, this is amazing. Why are you not sharing this with people? Oh my God, this has just changed my life looking at this draft. And this was an early draft. This wasn't even the clarity that I now have around these thoughts and ideas. And so people were like, oh, when are you doing an event? Or like, can I work with you? I was like, no, <laughs> I'm very happy with my business. I just want to put this book out. And I'm going to do a podcast. That's it. I'm not interested in, in anything else. Anyway, the loud, the, the, the thoughts started getting louder. And so I said, okay, 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 okay. I will put some money aside. And when I put some money aside, then I'll, I'll walk away from this business and I'll come and do this more full time. Mm -hmm. I'll do some speaking or something and I'll, I'll share this. Anyway, long story short, I ended up getting shown very painfully to just trust and stop trying to set conditions about how this is going to work. That's another story that requires its own podcast. But anyway, I, I decided to heed the call and I started to step back from my business and allow things to wind down slowly. And then I was at a meditation retreat in February 2018. And it was on the 13th of February. It's about 6.30 in the morning. I was in the mountains of Santa Fe, New Mexico. And I had this vision, and, but the vision doesn't even feel like a strong enough word because it felt like I was actually living almost like a life flashing before my eyes, yeah. but actually experiencing it of what my life would be like if I stopped trying to wind down. It's like a trailer to, of the future. Exactly, a trailer of the future, <laughs> but like a virtual reality trailer yeah. of the future. 
And that day I closed down my website. I walked away from my business and I full-time committed to doing what I do now. I think like, even as you were speaking, one thing that I was thinking about is certainty or uncertainty, mm-hmm. because a lot of times mm-hmm. you have this gut feeling or you have this, even like knowing that this is what mm-hmm. I want to do, or this is what I'm made for, or I'm certain that I, I want to do it, but there's still this like uncertainty, fear or doubts, or even like the mm-hmm. fact that you're doing, it might take you to start doing like different patterns or start to build different patterns. How do you mm-hmm. deal with that uncertainty? Or when do you know that, okay, this is true. I actually mm-hmm. am willing and ready to do this. Do you know one thing that I have actually realized for myself, and this may be true for others, I'm not creating a general rule, I'm just saying for myself, that I've never had any certainty. Certainty is a ridiculous thing to hold out for yeah. <laughs> because there are too many moving pieces. Yeah. The second that we think we have certainty, all of the billions of things that we don't know can come into the mix and mix it up. So rather than actually trying to develop certainty, what I've developed for myself and what I, when I'm working with people, what I encourage them to do is to develop a comfort with the uncertainty mm. and accept it for what it is. So how you, it. how you do that? Well, it starts by recognizing that there's so many things that we can't control. There's so yeah. many things that we can't have direct response, direct hand on. I mean, even if you look at the spectrum of light, right? The spectrum that we actually can perceive with our senses is like yeah. minute compared to the complete spectrum of light. When you look at the billions of people in the world today, all the things they're thinking, all the things that they could do, all of it, we just we don't have the computation power to stay on top of everything. Yeah. So rather than running myself into the ground or winding myself up, trying to control and trying to do those things, I come back to my sphere of influence, which is me. Mm-hmm. I can actually have a dominion over what's going on with my emotional state. If I learn to do so, I can work on my conscious thoughts, my unconscious ones. It's 10,000 to 10 million times the speed of the unconscious. I'm not going to be able to keep up with those. No. But what I'm doing with my conscious awake time, I can, ha- I can do something about. The choices of what I'm doing with my physical movement through time and space, I can do something about that. And I just direct that very intentionally in the direction of where I want to go and be okay with the rest of it working itself out. I think like, as you were speaking, I was thinking about, it's pretty much like you connecting with yourself, but at Mm -hmm. the same time, you might have some external um, influences from people that might Mm -hmm. be like, are you sure this is what you want to do? So like how you, how you deal. And I think one thing that might play a role in this is learning to trust yourself and actually be, and connect with yourself and really trust your decisions. But like Mm -hmm. what, what would be ways how to maybe not allow that, influence to affect you badly well that influence only has the power that we give it yeah (laughs) (laughs) right other people's opinions only matter to the level that i give other people's opinions more validity than my own so again it comes back to my sphere and focusing on that other people can say i don't like you they're welcome to their opinion if they decide that they want to pursue that in a way that impacts me physically mentally or emotionally then I have boundaries or I push back against it. But other than that, they're welcome to their opinion. You know, when we started doing more stuff on Facebook, like sharing my content, because we don't run ads on Facebook to sell anything at the moment, at the point of recording this, we do it to share content. We spend thousands and thousands of dollars sharing my content, but we get trolls. You know, we get a lot of trolls on the, in the comments, right? I don't even acknowledge them. It's like, okay, cool. Yeah. If someone, if someone's got such a lack of activity in their life, that they've got time to go around (laughs) on the internet and send nonsensical messages to strangers. I I pity them. Yeah. Anything. So, you know, or if it's someone physically like, oh, you know, they boo you or whatever. Okay. They're welcome to their opinion. The the power of that opinion on me and my reality is my responsibility, what I'm going to say. And so I just don't give it that power. (laughs) <laughs> it's it's With, like and that's a practice it wasn't overnight yeah. it was a practice mm-hmm. like what you as you mentioned responsibility i think that's mm-hmm. a really big one and like i think many times and i have talked to people when they're like i want to change i'm ready to change but they are still not taking responsibility even from for where they are before mm-hmm. they start to move to where they want to be um mm-hmm. what is the role in taking responsibility in let's say moving to the next level or changing certain habits or just your lifestyle in general 
So the model that I was working on through the story that I told you earlier was my beyond intention paradigm model. It, it's part of the foundation of everything, whether we're working with abundance or whatever. Beyond intention is going to be the vehicle for, for, for making that happen. And the very first step of that is accept. Yeah. And it's accepting that I am the author and the creator of my life. Everything that's happened up until now, whether consciously or unconsciously, has been a result of me and where I'm at. And anything that's going to happen going forward is going to be the fruit of the seeds I'm planting now based on who I am, what I'm doing, choices, so on and so forth. So long as I'm giving other people that power, so long as I'm saying that other people have a responsibility for my actions and my outcomes, I'm not going to be present enough in that situation to do something about it. Yeah. Simple. But what people think is that then what happens is they're having impact. They're not having an impact. They can't. What's mistakenly happening is people are losing sight of the fact that the unconscious mind is moving at 10,000 to 10 million times the speed of the conscious mind. And so long as I'm not consciously involved, my unconscious is running the show. And if my unconscious was giving me something that I wanted, I probably wouldn't need to come and listen to your podcast. Yeah. I probably wouldn't be doing personal development. I probably wouldn't be trying to find myself. I wouldn't be complaining. I'd be living my best life. So I already know that my unconscious program isn't doing the, the job that yeah. I want it to do. But I can't step up and do something about those unconscious programs so long as my conscious time is spent blaming other people in guilt, in shame, and all of this other stuff. It's imperative that my conscious time is spent being responsible if I'm going to do something about my unconscious programs. Yeah. Like going into money mindset and money abundance, um, how mm. I think many times it's people want to get in a better place. I don't know anybody who wouldn't want to get in a better place. Um, but many times, mm -hmm. and I, I had this conversation a few episodes back about how you know you want to get to a better place. And you want to get that abundance, but how you get in a mindset or in a mindset of abundance when you don't really have that around you, you don't have actual physical mm -hmm. like proof that, oh, I'm actually abundant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I've written a few books. Okay. One of the books I wrote is a book called Money Game, Money Game. And what Money Game's purpose is, is to give you the evidence of the abundance. Because at the end of the day, I think we lose sight of the fact that the mind isn't your enemy, it's your friend. It yeah. just goes on the back of the evidence that you've given conscious awareness to that's been seeded into your archives, your mental archives, and then it runs off whatever's in those archives. The way to change the data that it's running on is to change the data that it's yeah. running on by consciously creating that evidence. Again, if the unconscious mind was running on the stuff that we wanted, we'd be getting the stuff that we wanted. Yeah. So if you're looking for the evidence, it means that unconsciously seeded and planted and filed in those cabinets is evidence to the contrary so we need to replace that what we do with the money game um which is the my my manifesting tool that i outline in in the book is teach you to start with very small numbers and start to build evidence of you saying that you're going to get something and it coming and then watching that grow over time ergo abundance but because you're developing that conscious relationship to it other things open up so we've got beyond intention this tool money game money dna and the flow funnel these pieces are what we use to you know, the people that come and do our programs and make a million dollars or six figures and all this stuff, we're using these same foundationary tools because much to your point, if I don't have any evidence, I'm not going to yeah. be able to build on it. So we actually consciously build that foundationary evidence of abundance by playing a game that manifests money. And we've got the current recording record is 75,000 Australian dollars manifested in two days. Mm -hmm. That person now has got evidence, but also everybody who was part of that experience of witnessing them do that now they've got some semblance of evidence yeah. too. They can leverage that to create evidence for themselves and then leverage that to go and create more abundance for themselves. It sounds really similar to Joe Dispenza in his uh, retreats where people um, heal their cancer and everybody else sees that they have done it, it. And now they start to believe it as well. I've seen it. Themselves. I've seen it with my own eyes. I've seen people come in not reading and being able to see and they can see people not being able to hear. They can hear people come in in wheelchairs and come out walking, not necessarily running, but definitely not in a wheelchair anymore but there's evidence that we can now leverage what is the feeling in those retreats because i can imagine it's that is different kind of um environment mm -hmm. where you can physically feel that you're in a different reality in a way well they're specifically curated to to operate that way 
um, when I first used to go to them, they were always only on resorts or like closed off. There's a few more city ones. I don't think I've been to any of the city ones so much, um, but there was like one in Toronto, which was a bit different. I, I was there at the time. But when, you know, we go to the ones where you're literally <laughs> blocked off from the world for seven days, you, you do get the opportunity to just be in it, you know, yeah. as much as possible. I tried to like leave my phone off or like not really check emails and stuff for a few days. So you get to unplug. Um, he's made reference to it being, you know, going to a monastery for seven days and really diving deep. So there is, there is a separation. And even in my own retreats, I do similar process of, I say to people, you don't need to worry about anything. You know, we pick you up from the airport. We take you to the residence. We feed you. We have fun together. We do the work for a weekend. And then I take you back to the airport and then you can go. So you don't have to think about anything. You don't have to bring a wallet. No. It's again, that whole process of creating a completely separate space for people to integrate something new and then allow them to reintegrate back into their life, taking that on board. I think like what you just said with, after they go out, it's about like um, maintaining it or sustaining it. And mm -hmm. I, I heard you talking in one episode about how like for you in past, it was a challenge to maintain like financial mm -hmm. abundance or certain level of success that you mm -hmm. were aiming at. Um, mm -hmm. Like, what did you say is the difference between when you weren't able to sustain it or maintain it and now that you're able to do it? Definitely the flow funnel teaching that we share with, with our people and, and it's in our content. Um, there's a whole series of it on my podcast um, from, I think, episode 50 something. There's like four or five episodes where we actually break down the different steps of the flow funnel. But, you know, the the two times, I'm sure you're making reference to the time when I made and lost two million pound fortunes by the age of 24 years old. Yeah. It's because we as humans exist at different levels of density. They're parts of ourselves operating at different levels of density. And what that means is that although I'm sort of seeing my hand and I'm touching my hand, and I'm sniffing my hand, I'm not going to lick it, but I could taste my hand, right? This is one aspect of me. There's also the energetic aspect of me, right? There's also the thought form projection of me that precedes me actually witnessing me in, in three-dimensional form all of these things are operating at the same time by the time I've seen my hand the energies of my thought has slowed down in order to see my hand turning for example now if I want something in my life it also follows those same rules there's a physical expression of it there's the mental expression of it that precedes the physical expression there's the vibrational <laughs> representation that precedes the mental And there's also the instruction, whether that's an intention or a program. Now, if any of those pieces are out of whack, something can't stay. And this is what we found time and time again. When people come to our work that have been doing spirituality for decades, or they've been working on manifesting or working on their business or on their health with other teachers, it's not that we're saying that there's something wrong with what other teachers are doing. What we're generally doing is clicking into place the missing pieces for them to be able to integrate and apply what they've learned. Yeah. So people come to our work that have been doing, like I said, I had one woman, she'd been, she sat at the feet of Ram Das in the 70s. Like she actually Ram Dass, pictures of her hanging out with, he's an epic teacher. Yeah. You can't refute the truth of what he's saying, but it took her spending a couple of time, a couple of months in our work and clicking a few things into place. And now, oh, that makes sense. And that makes sense. And that makes sense. And that makes sense. Because We have to look at the fact that what a spiritual teacher, for example, will give you might deal with those, the vibrational aspect. It might deal with your energy. It might deal with your emotions. But if it doesn't address your beliefs, if it doesn't address your mental narratives, it's not going to change those thought forms and yeah. therefore it's not going to change what manifests. If someone's like your mental guru, like your mindset guru, that's like giving you all the mindset strategies, if it hasn't addressed what's going on with your spirit and energy, it's not going to... It's not like a mindset, the surface level. Mindset is just one aspect. I don't okay. believe that any one of these aspects is more important than the other. Okay. I think that they all come together. What we're doing, our actions, our behaviors, our choices, where we're at, our thoughts, our beliefs, our stories, our narratives, our energy, our flow, our spirit, you know, our vibration, yeah. our frequency, all of these things come together. With me, I had no physical experience. I didn't know the habits of behavior of a millionaire. Yeah. I didn't know that I had to have the right paperwork or I needed to have this and I needed to have, I had no experience. I was 19 years old when I made my first million pounds. 
I didn't know what the hell I was doing. What happened was I had such certainty that I was able to bully it into form, but then that form couldn't hold. Hmm. It's like having an ice cream in the sun, right? Yeah. It's, it's going to melt. And at the same time, you know, I grew up in a house where I was told money, the love of money is the root of all evil and all that stuff. I hadn't been taught to be in the energy of large sums of money. So I couldn't hold the vibrational frequency of it. So it broke down. As that broke down, my belief started to break down. And as that broke down, it was met with a lack mm. of experience. It all goes away. Yeah. I was able to then go and make another multi-million pound fortune. This time it took me a couple of years instead of a few months. But guess what? I still didn't have enough experience. I had the vibrational flow of holding money, but I still didn't have the experience. So even now, though, I had more of it. I didn't have the whole picture. Yeah. Fast forward now to me being a 37-year-old man. I have the intentionality, I have the vibrational flow, I have the mindset and I have the behaviors. So now I have the sustainable wealth that stays and grows. I feel good, I'm not stressed, I'm not in fear, I'm not in anxiety, and it continues to grow. And more importantly, I'm able to impart the seeds of that to others for them to be able to do the same because all of the pieces are in place now, not just belief, not just cleared energy blocks, not just great strategy, all of them working together. One thing that you said about helping others, that's another thing you were mentioning about sustaining success, that mm -hmm. when you were just building them up and you were failing, then I don't know, like you can't really call it a fail if you got to the million. <laughs> you learn a lot. <laughs> um, but like, I don't know, lessons. Um, at that time, you said mm -hmm. that you weren't really focused on helping people, that it was never your main thing or you would never consider doing it. But now like when you mm -hmm. actually help people, that's where you're able to sustain it um are they is there like any link between them or maybe it affects your mindset or like what's the what's the difference so here's the thing the first time that i made everything it was purely around helping people yeah the second time i said i don't want anything to do with helping okay. people so that's so <laughs> and now you know when i built up i built up a you know multi seven, multi seven figure a year business yeah uh after the second time of losing everything i built everything and that was sustained i left that business to come and do what i do now Now we have multiple set, multiple seven figure businesses that we've got now, and all of them are service led because when you're working in harmony with providing an avenue for people to be uplifted and served, you just get supported vibration, yeah. you get supported energetically. Um, the universe is always looking for the line of least resistance. Nature is always looking for the line of least resistance. If you have a river and you dig a bit of a ditch, the water's going to go in there because it's easy for it to go in there. That's just the way that it works. Um, uh, if there's a crack in the ground, then the, the plant will come through it. That's okay. just what nature does. So when we make ourselves available as a way that the universe can answer more people's prayers, guess what? We're going to be the avenue that it's going to come through. Yeah. So when we make ourselves available as an avenue, then we'll get used as an avenue because that's what nature is always looking for, the line of least resistance, the way to affect more with the least effort. Yeah, makes sense. Um, when you were, oh, I lost my question. I had such a good question. Um, <laughs> also, you mentioned the darkness. Mm -hmm. I think I think many times it's, we know that we're in a darkness. Like a lot of times we mm -hmm. are aware of it. And the longer we stay there, that the harder it is to get out. Um, how do you, what are the actual, oh, I remember the question. So like, how do mm -hmm. you, when you were building up those businesses and you had, well, you didn't really have previous experience. How, what is your process of like finding a way or learning or figuring things out? So I've got Asperger's. Okay. It's a form of autism. So my brain works like a computer, basically. Okay. It breaks things down. So I'm really blessed in that anything systemized, I can learn it. You know, if you give me anything that's got a clear step-by-step -step process, I'll be able to learn it. It doesn't matter what it is. But do you have the one where you have incredible memory as well? I've got very good memory. Uh, okay. I can remember sequences of numbers. I can remember sounds. I've got pitch perfect voice. I've got mm -hmm. stuff like that. So um, I, I've got really good memory. <laughs> yeah. My wife doesn't like to admit it when I'm remembering <laughs> stuff that she wants to remember a different way. <laughs> but and she's Russian as too as well, by the way. So I have to be careful for the, <laughs> the thing. But um, I I've got superpowers that allow yeah. me to be able to learn stuff basically. So um, as long as there's a system, I'll be able to learn it. If someone gives me something that I can follow, I'll be able to learn it. So that's really supported me in my journey personally. So did you look? Let's say when you did you 
one thing is to learn the systems, but how did you figure out what systems to learn? Mm -hmm. Trial and error. <laughs> <laughs> Basically. <laughs> did that work? No? Okay, let's try something else. <laughs> That's literally... <laughs> Um, one thing that um, I firmly believe in is dithering around, seeing if something's going to fail or not, not makes no sense. Just go for it. And if it yeah. works, it works. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. Yeah. You're going to find out sooner enough. So that's one thing I, I do my best to do, just to just try it <laughs> and <laughs> mitigate the downside as much as you can. Um, I like to look at uh, one of my mentors said, what's the best that can happen? What's the worst that can happen? What's the most likely that can happen? Prepare yourself for all three eventualities and just go for it. Hmm. So in a That's way, it. be prepared to either outcome. Exactly. Yeah, makes sense. I think like a lot of times when, when it comes to taking action, it's a pattern to many people that even before you take action, you come up with these stories or like perfectionism comes in where you end up taking no action. Um, mm -hmm. And like, usually what I say is that, well, you have this scenario in your head. Now go take action and see if it actually, if it's actually true. <laughs> mm -hmm. Exactly. I mean, so many people are sitting around, like you said, dreaming about it, wondering, you know, wondering is never going to get you to the other side. Yeah. You have to just try it and see what happens. And I think the more that people start realizing that the, the pain of regret is probably going to be a lot more than the pain yeah. of what might happen if it doesn't work out. And also placing too much importance on, um, on trying to get it right. Mm. It's like, at the end of the day, none of us are getting out of this alive. We're all going to die. Yeah. So don't take it all so seriously. Give it a try. Now, obviously, when other people are impacted, you need to have their, their say-so. I'm just going to leave my job and see what happens. What about, the, you know, you've got family, you know, take care of those responsibilities, yeah. be mindful, but still go for it. You know, spend yeah. some time working on, have the conversation. Hey, love, you know, whether it's your, your spouse or your whatever, I really want to do this. Let's set up a plan. Let's put a plan together for these different eventualities. Let's, and let's give it a try. Because at the end of the day, you know, again, we're not getting out of this alive. So let's just try. Yeah, I think even remembering uh, Robin Sharma had an exercise where you look at pretty much your funeral and you think about how you want to be remembered and then mm. pretty much like go backwards and create that life where you actually become that person. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's a beautiful way to do it. Um, but doing that and enjoying the process, yeah. not making it this... Because if your whole life becomes this exercise of, okay, I need to make sure that I'm, I'm on my way to where I want to be on my deathbed, that's probably I, not I think I was like that when I moved here. I was like, so I have to do everything or like being too serious. But now I learned that, well, it's all about actually enjoying what you're doing and the process of mm. it um, and just taking it day by day because nothing is really guaranteed apart from this moment, which is like mm. a lot of practice to actually be present and stay mm. present for like mm. longer periods, periods of time instead of just, let's say, five minutes of you meditating. <laughs> Mm -hmm, exactly exactly so going back to the darkness um mm -hmm. how what is a good way how to approach getting out of it because a lot of times when you are in that dark place you nothing really seems to like hopeful <laughs> mm. Mm. my journey through the darkness was accidental the first the time that I had a real darkness it was completely accidental when I was like okay my wife my life is useless I've got nothing to contribute I should just commit suicide which was back in 2008 I didn't jump out of the darkness actually I accidentally got so preoccupied with something that I forgot over oh. time about the darkness that was my journey what I found in my own life and then the lives of others, that the journey out of the darkness is actually through the darkness mm. and actually preemptively setting ourselves up to be supported for the dark times that will eventually come. Nobody gets away without a time in darkness. Yeah. Nobody. Every single famous person you see that's achieved a lot, they still have imposter syndrome. They still have stress. Life isn't going to get quote unquote easier if you get more money. One of my mentors did an interview 
um, with Richard Branson, who I'm going to get to meet next April. I'm going to Nicaragua next April. Oh, that's awesome. And he's, yeah, thanks. And um, he said, uh, Richard Branson said to my, my mentor, Nick, I'm always trying to do too much and never got enough money. Now, just put a pin in that. Richard Branson, one of the richest people in the world, started billion dollar, he started eight or nine billion dollar brands this guy has built up. Multi, 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 right? He's saying he's always trying to do too much and never got enough money. So even when he gets to that level, he's still not got enough. Not for him to spend because he wants, I mean, you can see what he's doing. He's always creating more value for people and doing cool stuff, blah, blah, blah. Pushing the frontier of humanity. So that's, he probably wakes up in the middle. There was a whole thing last year where I think it's Virgin Atlantic with the coronavirus, his airline, you know, it was, it was tanking. It was on the brink of bankruptcy. He had to do something of doing a thing with the galactic and doing that over there and doing a wiggle over there in order to raise 120 million to come and save one of his businesses. That probably wasn't hunky dory for him. It was probably a darkness because there's thousands of people, tens of thousands of people that work for him and his legacy and all of the things. How did he do it? He went off and did something about it. What was the root of, it, of that darkness? The root of that darkness was this challenge. No. He probably had the right advisors, the right counselors and the right support to go and make it work. I don't think he was making all the phone calls or doing all the thinking himself, but he was able to navigate through. When I've seen people that are dealing with shame or they're dealing with guilt or anxiety, pretending that it's not working or doing some clearing exercise or going to see your shaman isn't gonna push it away. No healing our way through the darkness i found time and time again is what is actually going to get us beyond it yeah i was reading some time ago about trauma work that a lot of times when it comes to trauma work it's about pretty much opening that box where you have this painful emotion and actually living through it without shutting it off and it takes 90 seconds for to feel that yeah. emotion fully but then At a lot most. of times we just shut it off <laughs> yeah <laughs> And because we At shut most. it off, we don't let it to go all the way where you can actually mm -hmm. start to heal. But it's really interesting mm -hmm. how technically it's 90 seconds. But a lot of times, let's say when you have this traumatic experience, you completely try to suppress emotion and you let it stay there. And then, mm -hmm. and it feels like forever to actually mm -hmm. experience that emotion. But technically it's only like one and a half minutes <laughs> mm -hmm. until it's gone and out of the system. Mm -hmm. And here's the thing. It's not just trauma, emotions yeah. as a whole last no longer than 90 seconds. Yeah. So that's a minute and a half of anger. Everything after that is you replaying it. There's a minute and a half of sadness, a minute and a half of grief, a minute and a half of happiness, a minute and a half of excitement. And after that, it's you replaying it. So by you allowing yourself to feel it, having the support, having the safe space for you to feel it, now, guess what? It's no longer holding you captive because yeah. you felt it. You've been through it now. I'm on the other side of it. It comes up again. Arms open, feel it. Do I need any healing off the back of that feeling? Is there something I need to address? Is there something that's come up after that experience? Yes. Okay, do it. No? Okay, move on. And that's it. Why is it so hard to do that? Because we've got fear. <laughs> <laughs> I can't go in that box. Ah. <laughs> Like we've got these stories that yeah, it's go not ahead. safe. We know we've got these stories that it's not safe. Mm. Yeah, it's it, one way how I was, I, I was crying one time and I mm -hmm. realized how when I was listening to those thoughts that were coming in my mind, I just kept reinforcing the process. But once mm -hmm. I was in a way detached from them, I was mm -hmm. able to go through emotions and then just move on with like my mm -hmm. life. But like one thing I wanted to touch on that you said before that a lot of times when it comes to money, it doesn't make life easier. I think last year when I was on a walk, uh, one question came in my mind, which was at what point did we start to make life hard? Because mm -hmm. it, it doesn't have to be hard, but at some point mm -hmm. we just decide it's hard. Mm. You know what? That's a really powerful question because there's a couple of levels to that. It's what is hard. Yeah, true. <laughs> Even, even that question within it has got a program yeah. encoded in it because I have to be given a story that 
of what hard means. Yeah. And then I have to be given a story to judge that as being bad. Mm, yeah. And then I have to add that those stories together and overlay them on my life. And then I've got these multi-leveled illusions around what is being something I need to resist and to saying that yeah. it's hard and all of this. Life just is. Does oh, it have to be hard? Die? What, what about when people die? Everybody dies. Yeah. This is not like a magical thing. Oh my God, that person, we're all going to do that. Oh, but I didn't know it was going to happen. We never knew when it was going to happen. Yeah. Nothing has changed. An event happened that we knew was going to happen at a time when we didn't know it was going to happen, which we knew we were never going to know. So we make up these stories about it, but they died of this or they died of that. It was always possible that they can die of this or die of that. Yeah. What happened is we started to resist and pre-frame uh, a, a rejection of that reality instead of here and now accepting step one of beyond intention. I don't know what I don't know. And there's some things that I'm never going to know. And I'm okay with that. I don't give any energy to it. No. Oh, but what about suffering in the world and all of the things? Are you having the suffering? Can you do something about that suffering that someone else is having? Yes. Then do something about it. Now it's not so bad anymore. You're contributing to supporting someone else in moving through a suffering situation. Otherwise, you're making yourself mad about your perspective on what someone else is supposed to be feeling about their situation. Mm. Does that even make any sense? But yeah. we give all our energy away to it. <laughs> we get caught up in it. And then we're not available to consciously choose what we want for our lives. We're not available to create more abundance. We're not available to create more love, more health, more harmony, more passion and more joy because our mind's tied up deciding how someone else is supposed to feel about their situation or, or even know ourselves how we are supposed to feel exactly which is all a story yeah i should feel bad about this but i don't <laughs> yeah why don't i feel bad about it yeah. i had a one-on-one -on -one, uh call yesterday with one of the ladies in my accelerator program which is like our we, the Accelerate program, we hold our client's hand and we get them to six figures in six months. So we do a bit more hands-on work with them. And uh, we were doing something around how she feels about her travel, traveling, right? And uh, I said, we're on a scale of one to 10, this is the ideal of how you'd like to be around the ideal traveling. She says, I'm a five. So the five, really? And we explored it. And it turned out that she marked herself down because she thought she's supposed to be doing more things and because she wasn't doing these things that she thought she was supposed to be doing, she was suppressing the level of appreciation that she had for where she was at. When we shone the light on that, she's like, oh, there's nothing I can actually do about that. You know, Sydney's just gone back on to lockdown. They were supposed to go to New Zealand, her and her husband, so they couldn't go. So she was, well, there's nothing you could do about that. Yeah. She went from a five back up to an eight out of 10. <laughs> just from a simple shift yeah. in perspective around around these things. I'm supposed to feel this way about the fact that that's happening. Really? Oh yeah, I don't even feel that way. I just, all unconscious, all unconscious gremlins coming in and taking over the machine. I think that's supposed to. It's something that like a lot of times, even not about how we're supposed to feel, but what we're supposed to do, how are we supposed mm -hmm. to live? It's like, we are trying to fight ourselves or what we know we want to do or what might even be mm -hmm. the best for us. Um, mm -hmm. based on certain, I don't know, image of how you are supposed to live or how you are supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what is supposed to happen? Yeah. <laughs> right. So someone said to me, oh, I guess if it happens, it's supposed to happen. And I just, I, here's my philosophical stance on that. Only one thing did happen. <laughs> <laughs> Something either happens or it doesn't. There's no should have happened, would have was supposed to, it's here. Yeah. So it doesn't really matter what was supposed to be there because it didn't happen. This is what's here now. So even just removing our energy and our mental glycogen expenditure on what should happen, yeah. what was supposed to be is going to be, and it's my destiny. The future is a field of infinite possibilities. Now what's here and what's not here, that's what matters. Yeah, I think even when it comes to making decisions, a lot of times you have two decisions that are really good and it's really hard mm -hmm. to make decision between them. And many times mm -hmm. we think about, well, if I make this decision, then this other decision might have been better. But like yeah. once you make decision, you just stick with it and don't look at the other one because that's past. 
it's past and it's just draining your energy. Yeah. It affects your mental and emotional space, which just impacts your ability to create going forward. It doesn't positively impact the past. It just negatively impacts the future because you're not available. Yeah. If I'm caught up in um, what's going on possibly in the future or what did or didn't happen in the past, and this is what step two of Beyond Intention is all about, freeing ourselves from this prison of the illusion of time and coming back to now. I think, like, what do you say is the importance of letting go in this? So letting go, surrender for me is one that I think is a very dangerous place that people hmm. play in. How would you because, describe, like, how do you see it? Because this is the thing. If I'm letting go, I'm surrendering to unconscious aspects of myself. Mm -hmm. I'm surrendering to my unconscious programs. I'm surrendering to what's going on with my energy. I'm surrendering to the divine aspect of self. If my unconscious programs aren't serving me and I haven't done anything to address that, when I surrender, I'm actually surrendering into unconscious programs. Mm -hmm. So it's not enough to just surrender. I have to surrender and know what I'm surrendering to. Am I surrendering to divine will? Okay, then I better make sure that my unconscious programs allow for divine will to be expressed. Otherwise, it's mm -hmm. not going to happen because the divine is not tyrannical. If I'm surrendering to my emotional state being the flow, then I need to make sure that that emotional state is actually leading to where I want and that my unconscious programs, which are the gatekeeper to my experience, will allow those things to manifest. Otherwise, it's not going to show up. So I need to take care of all of those parts of myself, like we looked at earlier, what's going on with my vibrational flow, my energy, my spirit, my emotions. Number one, what's going on with my, my mindset, my beliefs, my mental narratives, that gatekeeper, number two, and then my habits, behaviors. What's going yeah. on with all of those things? Surrendering without taking care of that is for me, suicide. Yeah, I think like, let's say in as an example, when you have those two decisions and now you make mm -hmm. this one decision and you stick with it, but you still think about the other one. Like mm -hmm. that's where I was thinking about letting go where you just let it go where you don't really focus on that, that's past. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And that's where like a lot of times, even when it comes to some past experiences, we just keep dragging them with ourselves or like even mm -hmm. some previous relationships. That's I think mm -hmm. where that like letting go in a sense that you, not like probably detach yourself from that person mm -hmm. or that scenario where you don't keep spending energy with like dragging that with yourself. Mm -hmm. I think Ram Dass said it best, be here now. Yeah. <laughs> one of one of, uh, one of my Danisms, one of my teachings is consciousness is in one place. You have time. Danisms, that's awesome. And that's what I call them, <laughs> I call them Danisms. Um, like consciousness is only in one place at a time. Yeah. So if my consciousness is here now, then it's not available for me to be pulled into the past. So it's be here now. So spending my conscious time focused on being present to what I'm doing, what I'm thinking, what I'm feeling here and now makes me unavailable. Yeah. So I always look for the hacks with all my work. I'm always looking for the hack. How can we just, you know, cut to the chase and cutting to the chase very simply is how can I be here now? And that's what we do. How you get in the now? You don't get in the now. We're always now. What happens is, <laughs> is that we start to layer on top of now stuff, yeah. which pulls us out of an awareness of the fact that we're always now, because now is truth. Yeah. The truth is that we're always here now, but we're not being here now because we're surrendering to all of the stuff. So some hacks are one is a great one is um, heart coherence. I've actually got a free resource on my website called Entering the Heart. It's a three and a half minute visualization that will get you into, and we've measured it. We've got the, we've done the instruments and measured it, but it will bring you to the now. So you can be here now. Great one. Um, you can use breath work to come into the now. You can use tapping. Some people use meditation. Some people go for a walk. Some people listen to their favorite song, whatever it is, it's whatever you need to do. So we've got uh, another resource on my website called the Clearing Encyclopedia on the free, these are all on the free resources mm -hmm. of my website, which is literally an encyclopedia of what I've researched over the last 20 years of different tools that you can use to be here now. Because like I said, step two of the intention, it's all about coming into the now. Um, so once you understand that I am already now, it's re removing the distractions which are putting me out of that truth, then it becomes a much easier process rather than getting somewhere. Yeah. I'm releasing things that are helping me to forget that I'm already there. Yeah, like one thing you also were talking about was 
there's a lot of times we say no, but mm -hmm. it's it's challenging to say yes. So like, what did you mm -hmm. say are the, why is it maybe making us it hard to say yes? Or why is it challenging mm -hmm. for a lot of people? Well, I think, I don't remember which study this was, but apparently there's a generally an 80% negatively weighted bias amongst humans. <laughs> And I think, you know, the time of recording this, we're reporting because it's in July of 2021, we're still in the throes of a global pandemic. So a lot of people are being filled with fear. Um, there's a lot of anxiety. People have been losing their jobs. People have been losing loved ones for whatever reason. There's this confusion about, is it because of coronavirus? Is it a big conspiracy? Should I wear yeah. a face mask? Am I going to get a vaccine? All of these questions. There's a lot of noise. Yeah. And all of this noise is reinforcing, I believe, that negatively weighted bias. Yes is expansive, no is contractive. If I'm in negatively weighted bias, I'm going to be leaning towards more contractive responses. So I firmly believe it's like a global cohere incoherent energy that's making no's the more common choice. Also, when you look at our lives in general, generally we're not trained to think for ourselves, we're not trained to say yes. Yeah. You know, uh, I look at my son, my son's six months old or seven months. He's going to be old, seven months next week. Um, I'm watching him take in his environment and, and, and he's learning from what his environment is. Now, if we're in an environment that's populated with no's, populated with contraction, populated with fear, populated with anxiety, what's he going to be learning? Yeah. Now, we are very consciously creating a, a more expansive environment for both the kids, but they go to school. Ariana, my stepdaughter is five going on six. She goes to school, she's with teachers. She's with the other kids. Those other kids are being programmed by their parents. So 80% of those kids are probably gonna be in a contracted yeah. negative environment. So she spends most of her time there. Then she's gonna go to kindergarten. She's gonna go to school. She's gonna go to high school. She's gonna go to university. She's gonna go into the workplace. Same with Ethan, he's gonna do the same thing. And all of those environments are gonna be impacting and none of them are training to be expansive. They're training to follow the status quo. Listen to the teacher, listen to the lecturer, listen to the boss, listen to the government. And I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with that, but we're not trained to do anything else. Yeah. We're not trained to lead, we're trained to follow. And so those no's are gonna just keep rolling and the effect of an impact of those are just gonna keep rolling and we're not gonna get anywhere different. How do you know when to or like how do you make decision when to say yes and when to say no i don't make the decision personally i like to tune into the higher aspect of myself the divine aspect of myself um with our work we use um human design um, which is a really cool modality that has an aspect of it around decision making and how we can make decisions in the body instead of in the mind yeah. um and I follow those tools and modalities in order to make really expansive body, not limited mind led choices. Yeah. Yeah. That's very interesting. That process, even like that, like what you said, you make decision with your body, not only your mm -hmm. mind, mm -hmm. that, that connection with like body where a lot of times we just think there's head and there's body, but you actually are like one body all together. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, the mind's got stories, it's got skewed perspectives, it's got narratives, the body doesn't have any of that. Yeah. So we allow the energy to move into the body and then give us the response rather than the mind getting in the way and confusing things. Yeah, like one thing that I realized about this connection was a few years ago when I was doing Wim Hof breathing, where at the end, he said, um, your body knows what to do. And I was like, Mm -hmm. Well, my body actually knows, like, I never thought I thought that I know what I need or like, whatever, mm -hmm. but actually your body knows a lot, and a lot mm -hmm. more. <laughs> mm -hmm. the, the mind is a great tool. It's a great soldier. Yeah, but we've given the reins to a soldier and left the soldier in charge and the soldier doesn't know what to do. Yeah, that's, that's so true. So maybe to finish off, I have started this few episodes back. Um, can you give um, a wisdom for us to finish mm -hmm. off with? <laughs> mm -hmm. here's one a danism for you yeah, i was about to ask danism <laughs> <laughs> the mind doesn't lose and the environment doesn't lie mm. can you expand on the that? mind does not lose and the environment doesn't lie anything that your mind accepts will show up anything mm -hmm. that your mind does not accept will not show up 
if you want to know what's going on with the mind, look at your environment, look at where you're at most of the time, look at the, the patterns, look at your habits of behavior, look at your habits of manifestation. That will give you an insight to what's going on in the mind. Develop a healthy relationship with your intentionality. That will support a healthy relationship with um, what's going on with your emotions. And we know that there's mind over matter, but there's crimes of passion. Even the law recognizes that emotions have a deep impact on what's going on in how we can think and what our reactions are. So when we start to consciously lead down from intention to emotion, emotion then to thought, and now that, then allow the thought to naturally flow into what we experience, you'll find that there's a lot less pushing, a lot less resisting, and a lot more flowing, creating. But ultimately, your environment's going to tell you what's going on. It doesn't lie. Yeah. But the mind will not lose. That, that mind is a gatekeeper to experience. Get it on, on board, not trying to fight it, not trying to resist it, but from the top down, giving it a new program and you'll win every time. I love this. <laughs> well, thank you for coming and sharing all thank the wisdom. Thank you for having me. <laughs> thank you for having me. I really appreciate it.